remember. All right. Um, well, it's good to kind of join back together for our Bible study after taking a break um, for our Christmas caroling last week. I'm actually kind of impressed we have as many people with us. I was telling um, Mandy and Rhonda before everybody got on that between it being the week between holidays and then also right after having missed, I thought this could be a pretty low attendance night um, of everybody kind of getting into some different zones, but I'm glad that we can all be together. And we are going to pick up in our study with um, continuing in Revelation and this time with chapter 15. Um, we're going to get into 15. We Last time we were together, two weeks ago, we were looking at some of the the vision that John had received in Revelation 13. And we're going to kind of skip over or at least skim over 14 because it's a continuation of that vision, um, specifically a vision of heaven now where this last one has been focused on a couple, the beasts and the woman and the, um, you know, the, the mark of the beast and the number of the beast and all of these things. And then you get a more heavenly focused vision in chapter 14. And this one, again, is not strictly chronological. It doesn't happen necessarily before the events of Revelation 15 and on. And if there's a good way to just show that really quickly without diving in too deep, um, in the middle of chapter 14 in verse 8, you have an angel who says, fallen is Babylon the great, and all these things, where in the chronology or the visions that we have outside of this Babylon doesn't fall until Revelation 18 so we kind of this is a, a a vision that is placed right in the middle here as a um, a break between these seven cycles that we've been seeing throughout the book and so there is some good stuff in there I mean it's it's very good but I think we're going to see as we get into 15 the continuation and culmination of that vision. So just for the sake of time, I wanted us to uh, to go to 15 and we'll read chapter 15, which is actually pretty short. It's only eight verses and then talk about it a little bit. Um, so I'll go ahead and read it for us and then we'll we'll start to unpack it a little bit and discuss. But verse one of Revelation 15, John continues and he says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations, or King of the ages, I think is a better translation there. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked and I saw in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. God's word for us tonight. Amen. Um, I feel like in all of the powerful and amazing language that we see throughout Revelation, all of these images which have kind of ingrained themselves in popular culture, chapter 15 is one that might get skipped over a little bit more often. It feels like a setup chapter as opposed to one that brings on its own all of these amazing uh, images or themes. But there really is something here that is worth uh, discussing and talking about and finding God's truth in. And part of that, I think, falls with 
how this is setting up these plagues or these wrath, this, um, the bowls of wrath, which are prepared. And especially when we start talking about plagues, it brings to mind another biblical story of note. Myself. Are you okay, Rhonda? Oh, I just choked myself. Oh no, you swallow wrong? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, know I do it quite a lot lately. <laughs> I can tell you how to do CPR. I need there you CPR. Go. There you go. Someone there to hand you some water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. <clears throat> um so I heard somebody say whenever I mentioned uh the the other story. Moses, the Exodus, right? Um, anytime we start talking about plagues in scripture, I think that's the first thing that pops up in our minds. Um, and we have this judgment of God being poured out on the nations, which really calls us back to the judgment of God being poured out on Egypt and on the Egyptians um, in the book of Exodus. And there's even the reference in verse three here that these saints who are gathered on the sea of glass are singing the song of God's servant Moses and when you look at what they're singing and then compare it back to Exodus chapter 15 where there is the song of Miriam is what we generally call it and it's a song of Moses and Miriam kind of singing together um, a lot of this theme these themes kind of get repeated so it's a definite illusion it's not accidental it's not mistaken as we do this um and i thought it was interesting i was kind of prepping and preparing and reading and one of the things that stuck out to me is that we see this kind of pattern a lot in scripture where the past provides the type or the pattern that we can look to for strength in the present or even in the future that what's happened in the past gives us strength to face what's going on now, what will go on. Um, and so I wanted to ask just practically and personally, are there times in your life where God's past deliverance gave you strength to face a present obstacle? See some general quiet nodding, some yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Mine is more of, I, I see some situations that could go really wrong, mm. especially when you have people involved. And so I'm like, no, I'm good, Lord. I do not need this test. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in this test that I need to know. There's nothing. Uh, pass this over me. I, because I guess you can say, though, in uh even jesus says if you can if you can pass this cup pass this cup mm -hmm. so it's like well if jesus can ask i can ask <laughs> exactly so and yeah it, it works it whatever bad thing blows over whatever um ill spirits mm -hmm. uh depart so okay um for myself I really think that remembering those times when I've been delivered or remembering those times where God's been faithful in the past are sometimes um, my biggest encouragements in the present or facing the future to say, all right, I know, I know God has done this. I know God brought me this far. You know, if we use that kind of terminology, he brought me this far, he's going to take me the next step. He didn't bring me this far to just leave me on the side of the road broken down. There's going to be something that comes next. Um, and one of the first times I remember having that feeling was literally being broken down on the side of the road in a car. And it was like the last straw of a very bad week. And having that moment where you say, all right, God, you brought me to this town. You brought me to this place. You brought me to this job. You brought me to this car that is not that uh, reliable but I know you brought me here. So there's going to be an end to this, even if I can't see it right now. Um, and sure enough, then you can always look back and see that pattern and how it's gone. Um, I think that's probably true for all of our lives. Those moments that seem impossible to handle. Then when you look back on them with the benefit of time and hindsight and seeing God's plan in the rear view mirror, you can say, 
oh, okay, I get it a little more now. And so that, that long vision into the past is really helpful for us as individuals, but I think it can also be helpful for us if we broaden that to communities, groups, churches, whatever it might be, to say, God has not just brought me to this place, God has brought us to this place. God has brought us through hardship in the past or um, brought us through sickness in the past or lean times in the past. And so we know God is going to care for us through this time as well, if that makes sense. And I think for John, the vision that God is giving John is one of comfort to the church as they're experiencing persecution from the biggest, baddest nation on the block, which is Rome at this point. And God is giving John this vision of say, don't forget the people of God have been in this kind of a situation before. Going all the way back to Egypt and the Exodus and saying that was an insurmountable situation, 400 years of slavery that was only growing more and more dire. The, what was being placed upon the people and the atrocities committed against them were only increasing. And at that moment, when all felt lost, their prayers rose up to God and God saw them and heard them and remembered his covenant and sent Moses. And so there is this, or called Moses, I should say, but you have this time of remembering the past in order to say, we can make it through this too. And it's kind of how time gets all, uh, to use the Doctor Who phrase, you know, wibbly wobbly here a little bit of um, looking to the past to encourage people in the present about what's going to happen in the future. And so you have this going on where John is encouraging them saying, in the future, there's going to be a time where you see that this was just like the Exodus and you're going to be called through this moment. And I think that speaks to us as well it doesn't mean that it's exactly the same it doesn't mean that history is repeating itself but that god gives these previous events that serve as kind of an archetype or a pattern for us to expect god's deliverance in the future just the same way that john the baptist was the fulfillment of the type that elijah was and the same way that david provided a type and Moses provided a type that ultimately Jesus fulfills, that of a, a prophet and a king and a savior in so many of those different ways. And so it's kind of interesting to look at that. And I think it's just helpful through this chapter and the next, where all of these allusions to Exodus come up to remember that's not just throwing in a cameo of something in the past in the Bible and saying, oh, how cool, it's this again. But to say, this is how God works in showing us patterns of his salvation um, in each and every age. Because even though the situations change, God's character doesn't change and our needs don't change. And so he ends up meeting them in similar ways. Um, but I wanted us to get into, I think, what is a really interesting image and one that drives the next chapter of Revelation, which is these angels, these seven angels who come out um, with wrath. They come out carrying or um, conveying the wrath of God, the seven final plagues, which are the wrath of God, um, before all is set right. And so, first, we've seen it pop up a lot in this book, but what does seven represent, especially in the book of Revelation? Because we've seen the same number pop up over and over. We've talked about it once or twice, but it's been a while since we were together. So to refresh it, does anybody remember what seven tends to represent here in Revelation? Completion. Completion. Completion, perfection, the, the total and right number of something is this number of seven. And so for God's wrath to end with a sevenfold offering again, is kind of this idea to reiterate, this is the completeness of it. This is the end of it and the finality of God's wrath and his judgment that we've seen being poured out throughout Revelation. These small bits, but so much was withheld and more and then more was withheld throughout the entire book. And we've kind of gotten to a point now where 
the full wrath is being given. And then this is the culmination of that. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting here is that in verse, I think it's six, um, where they come out, you have a lot of temple language and priestly language. They come out wearing white linen, which is very much what the priests would wear at the time, especially with these golden sashes or these golden emblems on their chest, which is exactly what the priests at the time would wear in doing their temple responsibilities. So this is an act of worship and following God for them to bring these bowls. And we've seen these same golden bowls be referenced before in the book of Revelation. And I'm not going to be offended if you don't remember, because it was all the way back in chapter five of Revelation, specifically when the saints were offering up their prayers to God their prayers for deliverance, their prayers for um, vindication. And they said, how long are we going to suffer? And they brought their prayers to God that they came to God in these golden bowls. And now we see these same bowls being turned around. Um, and I think we are meant to understand that these are a response to those prayers and the prayers of the church. Um, that this wrath, this finality of God's justice and his righteousness being executed in the world are a response to the prayers of the people. And especially after this comes, after those prayers, and right after the saints have worshipped and sung this new song, I think there's a really clear tie between the faithfulness and the righteousness of the church and being able to commune with God and call God to fulfill his purpose, if that makes sense, that we are not called just to be spectators in God's plan, but we have an active role to play, not just in yearning for justice, but in praying fervently for it, you know, being a praying church, a, a worshiping church, and a faithful church, because these folks who are praying are the ones, it says, who have been victorious over the beast and its image, and over the number of its name. So we have this righteous church worshiping and being joyous, um, and it almost clangs tonally, because as they are worshiping and in joy, we have these bowls of wrath prepared to be poured out over the world. Um, and I think we do a disservice to Revelation and to Scripture if we don't ask the uncomfortable questions as we read it. And so I wanted to ask y'all, how can the church worship and be joyful when wrath is being poured out all around? Them? Is that not cruel of the church to be joyous in the midst of wrath? Or what do we do with that? I'm going to be quiet and let y'all answer. Well, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So a good, true, mature Christian would not enter into um, vengefulness himself. And by this time in history, I'm assuming that these are mature Christians that are the righteous church um, being depicted here. So um, they're letting God just be who he is while they are who they are, which is to be worshipers of the Lord and trusting God to be doing what he does so well, which is be him. <laughs> well said. I saw some nods from everybody on the screens as you were speaking. So I think that resonated with um, just about everybody who was listening. Were there any other thoughts to that question or ways that you've struggled with that or sought to answer it in your own life? Well, I think a lot of times in our lives, we uh, can let a goof go oops and allow people talking to us, trying to help us out, but they encourage us to believe something that's not really happening. Um, for instance, when I got paralyzed, <clears throat> I had very... I probably had maybe 10 very strong Christians come and ask me what sin I had committed that God would choose to do that to me. And 
<clears throat> when they did that, I called my sister and I said, Sandra, this is happening. What, what's, you know, help me. <laughs> and she told me, she said, well, do you trust God? I said, yes. And so she just asked me several questions to kind of get my mind coming back in the right realm yeah. and the right thing that God wanted me to be doing. And at that same time, she helped me believe that I hadn't done any major sin that God was just going whack for. You know, he wasn't punish me, punishing me by that. But, and every now and then still, I will question, you know, God, I thought maybe you were going to heal me somewhere along the last 19 years, mm -hmm. but that's not what you have for me now. So maybe you could give me a hint, you know, what, what is it that you want me to be doing? Um, you know, he took <clears throat> the disease, took away all of the things that I used to do for God. Yeah. And le he left me only with singing, which is good. I mean, I'm glad. He but um, just with singing, you still yeah. have your mind and your prayers. How many times? I mean, you have the microphone not just to sing, but to do the prayers. So you got a head, and you got you got words, and they're got a lot of the times they're God's words coming there. So. Yeah. It's uh, I appreciate you sharing that, especially in your own journey. And I think we all in our own ways have those same questions where we want to know where does our experience line up with God's plan and why isn't it necessarily going in the ways that we thought it should go? And I think for these, and I was going to, it's kind of outside the, the, pattern I have here, but our conversation's going that way. So I'm jumping ahead. Um, these who are singing this song and talking about it are these ones who are victorious and they stand on this sea of glass, which again, we have seen before in scripture all the way back in revelation four, when we had this first image of the throne of God, and there was this sea of glass before the throne and then right there were the four living creatures that we saw that were so different and kind of um, awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so now, right before the throne of God on the sea of glass that is glowing with fire, because it represents, I think, part of the trials and things that the saints have overcome, we have them worshiping. But those who are victorious, we know from the previous chapter as well, this is referencing the martyrs. Their, their victory has been their unwillingness to worship the beast, their unwillingness to waver in their faith and their commitment, even to the point of death. And so we have this commingling of a willingness to suffer or to be conquered by evil in the sense of it overcomes you even to the point of taking your life but in the willingness to be faithful even to that point the beast or evil is the one being conquered because the evil doesn't get to have the final say in any of these saints lives or their experience as far as the beast is concerned it won because he's breathing and they're not but we would kind of backed up in this vision with John getting to see not just earth, but heaven as well, see that their defeat on earth is actually their eternal victory in heaven and they're singing and worshiping and looking out. And so you have this juxtaposition of suffering of the saints with their eternal victory, with their willingness to remain faithful and righteous, even in the face of persecution, trial and tribulation that they're in the midst of the wrath of God, but not overcome by it, that they're protected from that wrath. If we want to go to first Thessalonians one, um, you know, we have this idea that to be saved or to be victorious from the beast is not to be standing over him like David and Goliath sword in hand, victorious on the field of battle, but it can actually be look a lot more like Jesus on the cross 
it can look like a willingness to be obedient given whatever may come because we know that God holds the keys uh, to eternity and that we'll be vindicated in it. We know the end of the book. We know the end of the book. We know God wins. And so when we align ourselves with the victor of history and we say, I'm not going to be tempted off of that line throughout my life, no matter what comes, then we get to share in this victory that we see here. And I think it speaks to that so well of when we find ourselves suffering and the temptation is to say, well, God, I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to be one of your saints. Why in the world am I having to go through suffering right now? We, we see the, suffered. <laughs> this is, I mean, we see that being fulfilled, especially in this book written to a persecuted church, a suffering church saying, John and God are saying to these churches, I get it. I know what you're going through, but remember that your suffering does not have the final say and does not get to write the final page of your story. Well, maybe see it like this. Uh, I am one not to really go for football metaphors. Okay. But here's the day. <laughs> um, you have a football team. Don't ask me how many people are on the on the field. Mm -hmm. That's beyond just me. enough. Just enough. But only one person touches the ball. Mm -hmm. But you need the rest of the players to help support and to help make sure uh, that it gets to where it's supposed to be. Well, Jesus can do it all on his own, but he's not there to do it on. He he did it on his own, but he died and he came back. Mm -hmm. But while Jesus is running down the field and getting a uh, touchdown and winning the game, there are other people on the field blocking and helping the opposing team. Okay. It's not the best. It's football. <laughs> I'll stick to what I know. There you go. <laughs> but it's a great one for the guys. <laughs> Al's not we're, here to... <laughs> yeah we're gonna workshop our metaphors as we there keep going go. <laughs> um but i like this idea of placing ourselves which whenever we can is always the way that we should read scripture i think is placing ourselves within it and saying where is god's promise for me in this where can i place myself in the midst of god's plan and god's purpose in this text and i think we can always find that and I think for sure that's one of the places where we are here is in this crowd of worshipers. We're standing on the sea of glass. On, on the fire. sea of glass, exactly. On the sea of glass glowing with fire, but separated from it in the kingdom of God. I mean, near it, but untouched by it or un, uncorrupted gonna, by it. I was going to say untouched or uncorrupted because yeah. we are still singing God's praises. We're not going, oh my God, my feet are hot. Exactly. There's a protection there. Um, and I think as we, as we read this and as we look at it, um, we can see part of the reason, and it's, it's sort of what Sandy said as well, that this joy and worship at God's wrath is really not so much about being overjoyed at wrath, but being overjoyed at justice and at righteousness being worked out in the world, because it's not just about vengeance against this person or that person. Christ has told us to pray for those who persecute us. We can pray for the people who are being affected in these moments, while also saying, especially within the view of God's plan for all eternity, right here at the end that we're reading in Revelation, to say, this is part of God bringing his final purpose. And so, Praise be to God, because if there is judgment being meted out, I know his judgment is just. Amen. I know his heart is true and that God is not going to go overboard with his judgment nor be too lenient and let something happen again. So we can trust in the midst of that, that his plan's going through. And one of the things that I was reading as I was preparing really brought it home to me. And it was... Um, a reference, you know, we have such a, I would say, evolved to the point of being over-engineered justice system oh in our world where we have so many different officers of the law and enforcers of the law. And 
uh, the commentator that I was reading was saying, if you imagine being a town in, you know, the Mediterranean or outside of Judea, where there might not be seven different hierarchies of justice that all exist within this community. And so if there's not a judge or a magistrate in town, little injustices go unpunished. And you see a, a landlord who's absolutely abusing his tenants and you see somebody who steals from someone else. And even if you know that person's guilty, there's nothing you can do about it right now. There's nobody to go and enforce that law. Um, whatever might be going on within communities or within towns or within uh, these groups that you can be left without a recourse for justice until a judge comes through. And you might rejoice when that judge comes and says, all right, we're going to make sure that this guy pays back this person for what was stolen. And there's going to be a fine levied on this landlord who was abusing these people. And you assaulted this person and you're going to make restitution and setting all those things right. And then he said, and now take it a step even bigger than that when you look at these large global scale where you see the problems where the authorities themselves are unjust. Those that should be handling justice and doing it right are actually the ones who are perpetrating injustice on others. And so you have nobody to call out to or cry to in that situation. You're at the whims of an unjust system. And the only one you can cry to in that moment is God and say, God, set this right. Take these people who are abusing their position and help restore and vindicate what's right here. And so that there can be rejoicing whenever that is set right on this global and cosmic scale. And that's part of what we're seeing be worked out through these plagues as they'll be poured out in chapter 16. And I think it's a really helpful reminder um, because especially we want to have this, well, you handle it yourself. If you're being abused or something unjust is happening, you should take it into your own hands. But Sandy's exactly right that as Christians and as followers of God, we're specifically encouraged to say, you know what? Vengeance isn't mine to mete out because my justice has such a high probability of becoming unjust when it's in my hands that instead I can call on God and say, I know God's justice will be perfect and I'm going to wait on the true judge to get into town before I start running my own vigilante system for myself. And that is a hard word to trust when we're being abused, but it is exactly the word of God and the encouragement to these churches that are being persecuted and oppressed at their time. And I think it's a word for us as well as we feel persecution or we feel oppression or we feel hurt that perhaps anger and a desire to sort it all out on our own is not what God is calling us to do in the midst of being faithful. Um, and so I think that's important. You have something to say? I, before my football analogy, bring me off course. One of the things I wanted to say before that was in the first uh, verse of Revelations 15, mm -hmm. I was a, uh, for in them, the wrath of God is complete. Complete. So that means not just the judgment or God's judgment, God's final judgment. Mm -hmm. This is all coming to a friggin' end. We, we don't have to worry. We shouldn't have to worry about sin and stuff like that afterwards because the pain and suffering is, should be coming to an end mm -hmm. and we read the end of the book it's going to be glorious days we don't have to be standing on the on the glass of fire mm -hmm. uh, and we will still be praying and praising god but this trials and tribulations for all the different uh humans where you see in the bible story after story where humans raise up and then they fall and then they're they are you just see how human they are mm -hmm. and how how much how difficult it is being apart from god that 
we know that at the end of the book, we are with God. Yeah. And so that, I think, is part of the huzzah is because this is... <laughs> They're recognizing we're coming to the last chapters. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> and they're recognizing, especially being on that sea of glass, which we know is right by the throne of God, that being in the presence of God, even if they can't be in his temple at this moment, because his glory is being fully unleashed at this moment, yeah. that they are in the presence of the one who sets these things right and brings that justice eternally. Um, and so as far as making it practical for our day now and what we're doing, um, I wanted to ask all of us, where in our world can we be praying for the injustices that we see around us? Because human trafficking, how much time do you got? Yeah. This, yeah. I don't I mean, it there, seems there's like not one right answer here. Well, there's 8 billion yeah. people, so there's 8 billion issues. Yeah. What's that, Mandy? You just, I mean, it's easy to get very discouraged if you spend all your time watching the news. Yeah. Because you feel this big in a world whose problems are as big as the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't so. fight the world. You fight. You you make your in, environment better. You you start with yourself, and then it bleeds out. Well, and that's part of, I think, what the chapter talks about is this fighting the temptation to say I have to right every single wrong, mm -hmm. or I have to be the answer to every injustice while continuing to make yourself open for God's plan to be fulfilled through you. And well, I mean, you asked. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like, no. I'm, I'm not that. saying that you're wrong in this. I'm, I'm agreeing with you that I think those are the things that we are called first and foremost before we take anything on is to say, I, we need to pray for these injustices because we've already seen that prayer is what affects God's response in this chapter and in every chapter in Revelation, it's in response to the worship of the saints, to the prayers and the petitions of his followers and his church that we see these uh, purposes being fulfilled here as well. Um, so I think it's good for us to be in the world, but not of it, to pray for the injustices in our world without being overcome by them. Um, and to keep our minds focused on those who need intervention, those who are marginalized in our world in various ways and say, we need to be praying for them and trying to serve, knowing that God's going to get the last word, but we can continue to bring words to him in the midst of that as well, if that makes sense. Um, I really think that that's part of our, our call as Christians here. Um, and we don't know when that last day will be and when that last day comes, but we know from Jesus that we're supposed to be prepared as if every day could be that day, um, which yeah. means we need to be a praying church no matter what. The apostles thought it was any day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the church has for 2,000 years. So um, yes. as, we, as we read chapter 15, are there things that um, – questions, thoughts, responses, or reflections on it that we can share before we um, prepare to close out today? Okay. Um, next week, we are going to be looking at chapter 17. Uh, well, we're going to look at, uh, briefly go over 16, because it's really just the culmination of what 15 promises, these bowls being poured out. But then I wanted us to look at chapter 17 and 18 next week, which really both deal with the same thing, which is the fall of Babylon um, or Rome, as we see that imagery being used. And so I thought it would be uh, good to look at those next week and kind of see where we get with that. But um, so you can feel free to read those if you want this week in preparation for next week, and we'll get the year started off 
uh, with those following chapters as we get going. But before we close out in prayer, are there any other prayer requests or things on y'all's hearts that we can share before we, uh, before we close out our time? Um, yeah. 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 That we pray for the softening of hearts um, so that they can, so the hearts can hear Jesus and listen to the message and accept mm -hmm. the message into their hearts. And for Christians to realize that it is their oblig obligation to not just accept Jesus, but to try to develop the relationship with Jesus further and more in depth every day not just being a baby christian yeah 20 years later yeah well let's let's close out our time in prayer and uh and and just ask for god's blessing on us tonight father we thank you that you are faithful that your word is eternal and that your promises god will be fulfilled in your time and in your purpose and in your plan. We pray, um, as Catherine has mentioned, that more and more hearts would be open to your truth and to your word, to your glory and to your forgiveness. And also that we would not be content with just a teaspoon of the blessings that you promise us, that we would continue to dive deeper into your word and be changed by your love, that we would not just seek conversion, for ourselves or for those around us, but discipleship, truly following you wherever you lead us, because we know that when we follow you, we are transformed. So may your spirit be and rest on each one of us and give us strength and wisdom and words of love to speak until we are able to be together again. Um, and may we be the light of Christ in this world. We love you and we praise you, Father. Amen. Amen. Amen.